In the summer of 1927, in Tsukumi, the officers of the Soviet Secret Service were accepting an extraordinary delivery. 20 African apes sent from Guinea. The gorillas and chimpanzees were housed in a nursery that had been specially built for them. In the next room, isolated and under the watchful eye of Soviet guards, waited five young women. They had been chosen from hundreds of applicants who were willing to take part in an experiment that was to resemble a science fiction story. These girls, members of the Young Communist League, were to be crossbred with the African apes. The half-ape, half-humans born during that experiment were intended as donors for the Soviet governors who wanted to become immortal. In January 1924, in the Kremlin, Vladimir Lenin had been entombed. Thousands of people came to honor the dead and they sorrowfully waited for their moment to bid farewell to the great leader. However, those who saw Lenin dying felt even deeper sorrow. These were his party members. The night before his death, Lenin suffered from 42 attacks of epilepsy. He had severe convulsions. He yelped and howled. Although he was only 53 years old, his death was very long and very painful. But why did he depart this life so young? The resolution of the medical commission was shocking. Lenin died of atherosclerosis. A detailed examination of his brain showed that vessels in his head were weak and frayed. So, it was determined, the leader died of premature aging. Bolsheviks didn't want to die early. Nor did they want to die in such pain like that. The most afraid of premature aging was Stalin. His road to supreme power was too long for that. Sometime later, Stalin had finally established himself on the Soviet throne. He had fought for it for far too long and had wanted it so much. Now he intended to rule the country for many years. But this was not only because of his thirst for power, a person who is on top of society, who has lots of power and resources to satisfy his social, mercantile, political and other ambitions. This person has something to lose. When you have something to lose, your fear to lose it grows. So people who have lots of powers, who have boundless authorities, even suffer from obsessive fear of death. Stalin knew better than anyone else what people who seek power are capable of. He had already mercilessly and systematically destroyed his competitors. And he understood that one day, stronger players would decide to remove him. Stalin realized that if he grew to be old, ill and helpless, as Lenin was in his last years, he wouldn't be able to withstand his enemies. So immediately after Lenin's death, laboratories, clinics and research institutes of the Soviet started to search for the secret of eternal youth for Comrade Stalin. We could overturn the world, now we can overcome death. That became the new motto of the progressive Soviet researchers. That year, scores of scientists started their fantastical development of a new breed of human, Homo Soveticus. These new people had to be enduring, insensitive, persistent and authoritative. Also, they had to be able to live for longer. For this purpose, another group of scientists started experiments aimed at reaching eternity. 
The Soviet doctors were very interested in the issue of rejuvenation. They also knew enormous sums of money could be made from it. Officials needed a guarantee of a long and comfortable life, or even immortality. Death scared them a lot. They also didn't want to die. It was Lenin's private doctor, Abram Zelmanov, who proposed a reliable method of rejuvenation, soaking the body in the bath with turpentine. Theoretically, this procedure was set to stimulate circulation of the blood and renew the aging bodies of Kremlin bosses. However, Stalin didn't take baths with turpentine. He didn't want to take the risk, as it was rumored that one influential figure had scolded his genitals in such a bath. That is why Zelmanov's method quickly lost its popularity. Furthermore, there then appeared a new progressive method of Dr. Alexander Bogdanov. Truth be told, his method was so radical, it earned him the nickname Red Dracula in the West. It involved blood transfusions, which are very common nowadays. So, he invented a very interesting concept. If blood transfusions are made between an old person to a young person, nothing bad will happen. Old blood will dissolve amongst young cells and will be transformed. If blood from a young person is transfused to an old man, the man will quickly rejuvenate and his health will improve. His proposition was to transfuse blood from old Bolsheviks to the young and vice versa, and thereby connect the whole country by blood. It was an attractive idea, and immediately after the burial of Lenin, the doctor got the approval from the Kremlin. From then on, someone watched his progress very carefully and very closely. This was the person who was most interested in the treatment's development, Joseph Stalin. In 1924, Bogdanov started his first experiments. The elderly doctor first tested the method on himself by exchanging his blood with a younger volunteer. After that, he reported, as the result of the transfusion, my general condition, physical efficiency and appearance improved. The success was obvious. Soon after, Dr. Bogdanov was invited to the Kremlin. How are you feeling? asked Stalin. I feel much better, answered Bogdanov. At that point, he'd gone through three blood transfusions. Do you think this method can rejuvenate? asked Stalin. We're working on it, Joseph Vissarionovich. There are prospects. That talk resulted in Stalin's consent for the organization of the Institute for Blood Transfusion in Moscow. Bogdanov became its director. Soviet universities and institutes got the orders to motivate students to donate their blood for the welfare of the homeland. In the meantime, alarming rumors started to spread in Moscow. At the markets, railway stations and bars, people whispered to one another that blood was being drained from the youth to transfuse it into the deceased Lenin and raise him from the dead. Everybody waited for the miracle and hoped that Lenin would rise again and return to work. Nobody knew that the Kremlin itself was the initiator of those rumors. And so Stalin successfully masked his own search for eternity. His hope was to rejuvenate his body through blood transfusions. However, he hadn't had the time to test his new method on himself, when suddenly, after an ordinary transfusion, Bogdanov died. 
It later turned out that the doctor had died because the scientific world knew nothing about rhesus factor. This protein, which can be found in the blood of humans and some animals, was only to be discovered by scientists in 1940 and would be called after the rhesus monkey, which was used for the first experiments. In the 20s, however, the incompatibility of rhesus factors destroyed Dr. Bogdanov. Stalin was very much afraid. He understood that it wasn't good to make haste with rejuvenation. Firstly, the method should be fully verified. At that time in the Kremlin drugstores, there appeared another remedy for restoring youthfulness and longevity. It was Gravidan. This medicine was produced from the urine of pregnant women. It was invented by Soviet doctor Alexei Zamkov when he understood that pregnant women's urine is an inexhaustible source of vitamins and hormones. He tried the first experimental consignment of the remedy on himself and experienced a powerful rise of energy. After that success, the medicine was given the green light. First-rate Soviet scientists supported Zamkov. The writer Maxim Gorky personally supervised his work. Due to his own poor health, he was very interested in these rejuvenation methods. He was not alone. Director of Operations, Division of State, Political Directorate Karl Pauka, Director General of the Army Intelligence Jan Bursin, Semen Budioni, Clara Zetkin, Mikhailo Kalinin, and Lazar Kaganovich all took injections of Gravidan. Gravidan removes the thread of impotency and euphoria. It fills you with power and cheerfulness. It's extremely good. After only one shot, the patients felt fit, full of energy, good humored, a desire for action, and incredible lightness. But truth be told, it didn't last long. And it was only 10 days before the next shot was needed. The main thing was that the potion was effective. In the meantime, it became a sensation in the Soviet press. The longevity elixir was found. After a dose of Gravidan, the patient was able to work 14 hours a day and overperform by 300%. Doctors started to use Gravidan to treat impotence, cancer, depression, senile marasmus, and children's schizophrenia. Dr. Zamkov became the people's idol and the object of the poetical inspiration. A Soviet doctor, Zamkov, and it was some five years ago. He solved the problem and was concise. As he invented such a device that makes a drug from urine, to be precise. Let's give it the critical acclaim, Gravidan. In spite of general excitement, Stalin underwent only one course of the Gravidan therapy. He decided not to proceed further, and later it turned out that he was right. After a few years, the side effect of Gravidan was discovered. The medicine acted like a hormonal drug and was addictive. According to the directive from the Kremlin, a common admiration for Gravidan was soon replaced by social disapproval and Dr. Zamkov himself was called a charlatan. How could the ongoing mystery of eternal youth be solved? While Soviet scientists tried to get to the bottom of the problem, the Kremlin turned its attention to the West. At that time in the West, there was a very popular French doctor of Russian origin, Sergei Voronov. After his unique operations, patients immediately seemed younger. 
became physically stronger and more virile. What did Surgeon Voronov do? He transplanted into his patients the sexual organs of monkeys. A French doctor with a Russian surname was not a political émigré. Before the revolution, he went from provincial Voronezh to Paris to study at the Sorbonne. During his time as a student, he took great interest in eugenics, a science about creation of the perfect human, who could live forever, or at least for a very long time. In Paris, Voronov started to search for the secret recipe of eternal youth. In the French National Library and the book depositories of Sorbonne, Voronov managed to find ancient manuscripts where he read incredible recipes of eternal youth, made up by alchemists, philosophers, doctors and monks. Some of the recipes were far too exotic. An example of one such recipe was to reach eternity. You must grind a 100,000-year-old frog. To that, you must add dried spider's webs. And then the hind quarters of bats. Then you must dry it all and make a powder out of it. This powder must then be dissolved in water and taken on an empty stomach on one tablespoon. I wouldn't risk trying it, would you? There was another recipe from ancient Persia, which seems to be rather strange and time-consuming. Take a red-haired and freckled person and feed him with fruits, there you go, till he reaches 30 years old. Then hermetically cork him up in stoneware, full to the brim of honey. In 120 years, the body will turn into a mummy. Then it must be turned into powder, dissolved in water, and taken over two months. Such food supplements guaranteed eternity if taken properly. I'm not sure if anyone has ever tried this strange recipe, but it really did exist. Voronov understood that all these methods were just a con. No one had ever been able to find the secret of perennial youth, even though man had tried to solve this secret through the ages. For example, in the East, they ate dried elephant skin to rejuvenate, with the theory, the more you ate, the younger you'd become. In the West, during the Middle Ages, rich men ate mixtures of gold and powdered jewelry. They even secretly committed crimes like killing babies. After the ritual sacrifice, their blood was consumed as a rejuvenating drink. But even this was not the most outrageous craze performed in the quest for eternal life. For example, Hungarian Countess Elizabeth Bathory took daily baths in the blood of murdered virgins. At her 40th birthday, Elizabeth looked like a 20-year-old girl. When her crimes were revealed, even rejuvenating baths couldn't help the Countess. She died in jail of old age. Young Voronov read about all of these terrible and bloody searches for eternal youth and couldn't believe his eyes. People went to every length to get perennial youth. The better he understood the price of the secret, the more he wanted to become the first to discover it. After all, the opportunity was a gift in itself. After graduation from Sorbonne, 
the talented Dr. Voronov was invited to Egypt to look after the health of the country's governor. So, Voronov rushed to the east, still hoping to unravel the puzzles of eternity. In the east, they always considered it prestigious to have a European doctor in the court. Voronov had access, not only to the body of the king, but also to his harem. Suddenly, the attention of the young doctor was captured, not by women, but by the eunuchs, harem supervisors castrated in their childhood. While watching these Egyptian castrated men, Voronov noticed that all of them were apathetic, fat and bluntish. They had poor memory and slow reactions. The most important thing was that they aged much more quickly. Their aging processes were accelerated. They very quickly forgot things and they also gained weight easily. Voronov came to the conclusion that castration was the reason of these such processes. He started to think about the consequences of transplantation, of reproductive organs from dead people or from animals. We can do it vice versa. If genitals of a young man are transplanted to an old man, the rejuvenation reaction will happen. Voronov decided to check his theory in Egypt. He asked to be brought the oldest and the weakest animal. This was a 13-year-old male sheep. In a simple Egyptian hangar, Voronov executed his first operation and transplanted a testicle of a young lamb to the old sheep. A miracle happened. After two months, it was hard to recognize the old sheep. Now it was an animal with nice posture, vivid sight, shining and thick wool. Sometime later, a local sheep gave birth to a healthy lamb, whose father was this rejuvenated ram. Voronov returned to France from Egypt, absolutely certain the experiment was worth trying on humans. Soon after in Paris, with the help of his Sorbonne instructors, Voronov conducted his first mass experiment. He obtained access to the organs of criminals who had been executed. Voronov cut out their testicles and proposed giving free-of-charge rejuvenating transplants. These pioneering operations created a real sensation in France. Elderly Voronov's patients got visibly younger in front of everybody. They also instinctively began behaving as young men with renewed vigor. Soon after, rumors spread in high society about Voronov's project. Aging millionaires started to queue up for the rejuvenation treatment. The numbers interested in receiving donor organs soon outweighed the number of organs available. Because of this, Voronov decided to use apes as donors. Why did he choose apes? Dr. Voronov considered that their organs are more stable. Gorillas, chimpanzees and baboons don't suffer from rheumatism, syphilis and are not prone to alcoholism. Dr. Voronov didn't know that apes can become the source of an infection lethal for humans. He knew nothing at the time about the apish virus, which would ultimately go on to strike humanity. It was the 12th of July, 1920. French doctor Sergei Voronov was the first in the world to successfully attempt transplantation of ape organs into a human. 
cuts of the chimpanzee and baboon testicles were grafted into the scrotum of an aging British millionaire recipient. The whole of France waited impatiently for the results of the operation. How would the patient feel? Would the testicles of an ape survive in a man's body? The operation was very successful. The millionaire climbed up Mont Blanc with an expedition of mountain climbers and took part in different activities. But there was still one problem. In spite of the effectiveness of the operation, its effect was only temporary. And it was decided a follow-up operation must be performed within three to four years after the first. What Voronov did not know was that his operations were to release a deadly virus into the human population, which we still cannot cure to this day. This lethal virus is now known the world over as Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. When scientists started to discover the origins of the HIV infection, they considered the theory of apes being initial virus carriers. They found significant HIV risks present during the sex organ transplants from apes to humans. Nobody knows the exact operation that allowed the transportation of the AIDS virus into the human population. Although it is practically proven that it happened through Voronoff's transplants. And most gerontologists believe this to be the case. The virus took a fair amount of time to present itself. However, when the infection spread, the doctors knew that it was like nothing they had encountered before. Voronov was dismissive of the virus. He was totally convinced that he had presented people with a real chance at achieving eternal life. In the 20s, he actively performed operations on prime ministers, financiers, bankers and diplomats. He even founded an apish nursery on the French Riviera to ensure the constant supply of organs. All the newspapers reported on the wonderful results of the experiments carried out by the daring surgeon. Voronov became a millionaire. He rented the first floor of one of the most expensive hotels in Paris and surrounded himself with servants, secretaries, guards and courtesans. If you are too old for dancing, get yourself monkey testicles. The lyrics to this song were very popular in Parisian clubs at that time. Sergei Voronov became a real star of the French capital. Songs were written about him, and best banquets were organized in honor of him. Meanwhile, fashionable Parisian barman Harry McElhone even created a cocktail, Monkey Gland, named after his technique of grafting monkey testicle tissue into humans. A cocktail of gin, absinthe, grenadine and orange juice warmed up the eager public and everyone hoped that eternal life may actually be possible. The drink did appear to be a more realistic option than Voronov's daring experiments. Up until 1924, the year of Lenin's death, Voronov had performed 53 successful operations. Leaders in the Kremlin kept a keen eye on Voronov's progress. Coming next, a proposition from the Kremlin. Who among Soviet bosses had agreed to an ape testicle transplant? Bulgakov's foresight. Strange freight from New Guinea. How were girl members of the Young Communist League crossbred with guerrillas? Had Stalin discovered this new theory of eternal life?
In 1925, Stalin received news of the phenomenal success of Parisian Dr. Voronov. Having researched him, Stalin and his party decided to invite Voronov to the Soviet Union. They hoped that baboon hormones and that of orangutans and gorillas could help them to avoid multiple sclerosis, which had claimed Lenin's life. Voronov didn't accept the Bolshevik proposal. He didn't want to leave Europe, the Europe that applauded him and showered him with success and celebrity. Why would he want to leave Paris for the hungry and revolution-wrecked Moscow? The Bolsheviks then decided to copy Voronov's method and decided to teach talented Soviet doctors to perform the transplants. But who could be trusted with such an important and delicate task? The only doctor who had access to both great leaders, Lenin and Stalin, was a general surgeon, Volodymyr Rozanov. This surgeon is the best, wrote Lenin about Rozanov. In 1918, after the attempted murder of Illich, Rozanov successfully operated on him and continued as his physician and surgeon until Lenin's death. In addition, Rozanov was entrusted to remove Stalin's appendix so it came to be that Vladimir Rozanov was chosen to perform this important mission. The first Bolshevik transplantation of monkey's organs into humans. Rozanov agreed. He had long been a key observer of Voronov's work in Paris and was ready to give an adequate Soviet answer to the bourgeois surgeon. After special instructions from Dr. Rozanov, two monkeys were sent to the Kremlin laboratory. Rumor has it that these animals have been earmarked as donors for two brave Bolsheviks, writer Maxim Gorky and security officer Vyacheslav Menzinsky. Some suggested that these men were operated on, but no rumors were ever substantiated. Only one official document about this operation remains in existence. It is dated December 29, 1925, and its content is rather ambiguous. It read, in response to request number 2022, Botkin Hospital informs that it is desirable for them to have 50 monkeys per year. Large breeds are preferred, Hamadryas baboons, other baboons, and at least two chimpanzees. Monkeys are needed for experiments and for transplantation of human endocrine glands. So it would seem that the operations did take place and that they were deemed to be successful. The Kremlin demanded more monkeys. The problem was how to transport them into the Soviet Union without provoking suspicions. After a short time researching, a monkey enthusiast was found. It was Professor Ivanov, a biologist of international fame. He was the first in the world to attempt artificial breeding, to get hybrids of donkey and zebra, antelope and cow, mice and rat, guinea pig and rabbit. However, he had his own precious dream, the same as Voronov had, to crossbreed a human with an ape. Professor Ivanov believed that experiments with hybridization would create hybrids to become an exclusive source of organs for transplantation. Then such hybrids could have been domesticated. They would be as strong as chimpanzees with a 25 times faster response time than humans. 
Such hybrids could shatter stones and also be capable of being trained. They could live in the north, in the area of Novaya Zemlya, in the regions of atomic weapon testing. They could become objects for military experiments. The Soviet government allocated funds to Professor Ivanov. So he left for Guinea. Before his departure, Ivanov received a personal directive from Comrade Stalin. We must bypass nature. Politburo gives you five years to complete your experiment. Good luck. After just a year, a ship containing cages full of monkeys returned to the Soviet Union. All of them had been caught by Professor Ivanov. At the same time, he gave instructions to organize the search for volunteers to participate in an historic experiment. Crossbreeding of monkeys and humans. It had to be young, healthy women. But what normal female would want to enter into sexual intercourse with a monkey? Incredibly, there were many volunteers who came forward. A lot of women from the Young Communist League stepped forward to help in the name of Soviet science. These Soviet women were willing to become pregnant by gorillas and orangutans and give birth to little ape men for free for the benefit of the motherland and for science. Even though there were many volunteers, only five of them could participate in the experiment. So competition was fierce. I shall comply with all requirements related to the experiment. I believe in the possibilities of fertilization. Worst case, if I'm not chosen, then please send me the address of any of the foreign zoologists. All female members of the Young Communist League who had to be artificially fertilized by animal sperm had to be healthy, physically strong and with great vitality. In Ivanov's laboratory, they were called special employees and kept in a separate isolated room for the sake of clarity of the experiment. While the professor was preparing for the historic crossbreeding of a monkey with a human, in the Kremlin, they excitedly awaited the new animals. These monkeys needed to become donors for the aging party bosses, so it was in Moscow's interest to be patient. However, unexpectedly, Professor Ivanov stood up for his apes. Moscow sent a letter to Sukumi, requesting two more monkeys. Suddenly they were met with a negative response. We have sent you monkeys before, and the results were regrettable. The apes had apparently been used for organ transplantations into high-ranking officers, and nothing is known about the results. Maybe somebody had died. Perhaps the operation turned out to be unsuccessful. An ape could have died as the result of it. Ivanov understood that resistance impacted heavily on his work and that his own experiment could be jeopardized. Apes were very hard to come by because not all animals survived during the trip from New Guinea to the Soviet Union. The apes who did survive during the trip started to die from stress, an unfamiliar climate and bad diet. There were no refrigerators in Tsukumi for tropical fruits, so the animals were fed boiled eggs and jam, and many of them died. Ivanov planned to use the surviving apes for his experiment of crossbreeding with young women. It's believed that Ilya Ivanovich hoped to get the Nobel Prize and he had real chances of winning it. It could be seen as a scientific breakthrough. 
Everything was proven theoretically. The problem was only with the practical evidence. As it turned out, it was very hard to crossbreed humans with apes between 1929 and 1930. As a result, there was a great divide of opinion in medical circles. Moscow and Tsukumi couldn't share apes, and there weren't enough for both experiments, one concerned with rejuvenation and the other concerned with crossbreeding. All this soon erupted into an international scandal, and the focus turned to the maverick professor Ivanov. The fate of extraordinary crossbreeding was sealed by the popular press. American newspapers wrote about crazy Soviet experiments breeding half-human, half-apes. The research had to be quickly scaled down and classified as secret. To prove that monkeys were used only for the ordinary medical experiments, an institute in Sukumi was founded, performing only medical research. Ivanov ignored the rules and refused to give his monkeys for donor transplant organs. He was arrested and deported from Sukumi. So did Ivanov ever manage to carry out his experiment? The truth is still hidden in the secret archives of the NKVD. We know of only one piece of correspondence from the professor, which he wrote to his Moscow colleagues from Sukumi. A hybrid person related to anthropoids grows faster from birth than a human baby. Until the age of three or four, he gains incredible power. He is much less sensitive to pain and undemanding. Of all delights, he prefers sexual pleasures. His most important advantage over living creatures, including humans, is an ease of management and an impeccable obedience. Useful potential of the hybrid creature is boundless. From work in the wet coal faces to military service, so we can assume Professor Ivanov managed to crossbreed a man with a monkey. But what happened to these hybrids? Were they used in the call of duty for their country? Did they die in captivity in a secret Sukumi laboratory? Answers to these questions are still unknown. We know only that the arrest of Professor Ivanov did not put an end to the experiments in the Soviet Union. In fact, there was much interest shown in them. In 1925, Professor Brianenko presented a dog's head on a dish to the medical community. The head blinked, stuck out its tongue, and even ate a sausage. Another professor, Zavadovsky, boasted about his achievements, namely changing the sex of a cock into a hen. At the same time, near Leningrad, scientists were working on creating a Soviet Itiandra, crossbreeding a man and a shark. Most of these experiments were carried out in strict secrecy. People and animals quietly died in laboratories. Soviet doctors on Stalin's instruction were exerting ultimate control over nature, even if they had to do so with extreme force. The world learned of this strange time through Mikhail Bulgakov's novel, A Dog's Heart. I shall transplant monkey ovaries to you. Really? Is it possible? A monkey? Yes, it can. When shall the operation take place? On Monday. Bulgakov was sure that all attempts to turn the animal into a human, 
to bring to life a new creature or to change the nature of it were doomed to fail at the outset. Sharik may become Sharikov, but only on the outside. Professor Priobrzezinski was the only person who would take full responsibility for his experiments. That was the uniqueness of Bulgakov's prophecy. A popular surgeon, Sergei Voronov, became a new version of the professor in a dog's heart. Dr. Bulgakov must have had clairvoyant gifts. In the 20s, he predicted the casting out of Voronov's ideas, and he was not mistaken. There were no good results that came of the clinical experiments of the French professor. After two years, in 1927, the world's celebrity Voronov suddenly became a worldwide laughingstock. That year, the first British millionaire patient operated on by Voronov had suddenly died and was the first in a number of subsequent deaths. All brave rich men with monkey's testicles quickly aged and died. Voronov would not admit defeat, but the evidence was clear. The monkey-derived elixir of youth did not work. It turned out that male genital transplants have a significant effect on men. In the way that an energy drink might. At first, the man experienced a real boost, but the effect was temporary. And the end result is a horrible reverse effect. Patients aged quickly, but continued to experience strong sexual desire. For the creation of such infirm and oversexed old men, Voronov got his offensive nickname, Dr. Erector. Ultimately, he was forced to close the clinic and stop his experiments. In the Soviet Union, Voronov-style experiments stopped only after the war. Mikhail Kalinin was the last victim of these experiments. In 1945, a prominent surgeon, Boris Podrovsky, transplanted the testicles of a young man into a 70-year-old Kalinin. After four weeks, the body of the recipient became rejuvenated. His gray hair disappeared. His voice altered. He had a spring in his step. But just three months went by before the process of quick aging began. And eight months later, Kalinin died. Stalin learned about this failure, but didn't stop the search for the elixir of youth. He spent another 10 years looking for it. He sent researchers to the Caucasus Mountains to find the secret of longevity there. He drank only spring water and ate the best food. Stalin founded important gerontology institutes in Kiev and Kharkov. He personally called their directors to keep track of their progress but to no avail. His death was instantaneous. He died of a brain hemorrhage. Lonely, paralyzed and weak, he was lying on the floor, while in the next room, his comrades quietly and patiently waited for his death. However, after Stalin's death, the quest for longevity continued with interest. The next rulers of the Kremlin were also afraid of dying young. They invested heavily in developing drugs to combat aging. For rejuvenation, they chose to drink water from the Antarctic 
and took shots of embryonic tissue. Every day, Chinese leader Mao Zedong drank two liters of women's breast milk. But it was all in vain. Each of them died as an ordinary mortal man would have done, in the usual way. Were the efforts of hundreds of doctors, gerontologists, physiologists and researchers useless? What legacy do these experiments leave with us? Incredibly, it turns out the development saved thousands of lives. The experiments carried out by Dr. Bogdanov helped create the Institute of Blood Transfusion, which saved thousands of lives. In Sukumi, all essential medicines were tested on monkeys. They also used monkeys for space travel in a spaceship similar to the one in which Yuri Gagarin flew. What about the secret of eternal youth? Scientists are still searching for it. Strange experiments are now carried out in the secret laboratories of Moscow, Peking, Tokyo and the USA, just as they were in the 1920s. Their task remains the same, to find the secret of eternity. Their results are equally unsuccessful. That is because no researcher has yet managed to answer another important question. Do humans need eternity?